Welcome to Cut the Bull, an insightful podcast which addresses the news of the day and the cultural issues plaguing our society, bringing logic and context to these topics and discussing solutions too real for mainstream pundits. Now, here are your hosts, Charles Love and Wilfred Riley. Hello and welcome to Cut the Bull. I am Charles Love. Joining me this week is Christy Kelly. And our guest this week is uh, Tiffany Justice, the co-founder of Moms for Liberty. Tiffany, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, it's great to have you on uh, to talk about all things uh, Moms for Liberty. Um, I don't know if you realize this, but your organization has been in the in the media a lot. And um, there's been a lot of speculation about what you stand for, what you believe and what you think. And I figured we'd clear the air, uh, you know, down the road on some of those things. But I guess we should start off with why Moms for Liberty, Liberty, why you started the organization. What was the problem that you were seeing that you felt needed to be addressed? Thank you uh, for that question. It's a great question. Um, Tina and I are we're the co-founders of Moms for Liberty. And we both served on school board from 2016 to 2020 in neighboring districts. We share a, a border on our, our school districts in Florida, um, but we did not know each other. And a lot of people always say, oh, friends, but we didn't, we, we weren't even friends. We really didn't know each other. We just lived in neighboring counties, both served on school board, both moms, uh, and uh, had kids in the public school system. And when you have a perspective when you get blessed with this opportunity to see something from two different sides one as a consumer as a parent as a stakeholder and then on the other side as an elected official where you're balancing you know the the input from constituents you just get a very unique opportunity where you're not a school board member that only hears about issues that are happening at the supermarket line or at church, right? When people complain to you about something, but you're actually getting to see um, the process and procedure of the policy that you're passing as a school board member. It's fascinating. And I think we both saw that um, teachers unions had an undue influence on our children's education, first of all. Uh, they're responsible for things that you would never think that they would be responsible for, like uh, your kid eats lunch at 10 o'clock in the morning. That might be because of the bargaining contract. I did an interview um, with a woman in New York that was talking about some of the things that the bargaining contract that the the mayor of, of New York City has bargained with the teachers union that hasn't been in the best interest of students. That's Mayor, mayor Eric Adams. Um, so we saw that. And then we just saw during COVID very directly that parents were coming forward and trying to have their voices heard and they were being shut down in every turn and they were having a hard time becoming effective advocates. And so when our terms ended, uh, Tina came to me, we had met once before during the COVID fight because we were really on the downside of most of the votes that were happening in our districts. So we both have five members on our boards and it would be a four, one vote with Tina and I on the bottom of the vote. Uh, standing for parental rights, fighting against forced quarantining and forced masking. We were quarantining healthy kids. It was absolutely atrocious. And uh, she came to me and she said, we've got to do something about this. We can't just leave these parents. We have to help them to be effective. And so we talked throughout December of 2020 and discussed uh, and built out Moms for Liberty. The mission statement is the same one that we launched the chapter, we launched the entire organization with in January 1st, 2021. And today we have uh, 299 chapters in 46 states uh, with over 120,000 um, active members. It's not an email list. They are members on the ground doing work across the country. Um. You asked earlier, you know, so what's, what's the conversation going to be like? What's the show like? And I said, we just talk. So a lot of it's based on what you all say, what you say. And I'm sure uh, Christy will get into a lot of the specifics about what you saw. But you said one thing that made me think. It's like you talked about the, the unions having so much control over the schools. And you're like, what time do you have lunch? You said 10 o'clock. And that just made triggered me for a moment because I remember sending my kid to school. I'm like, you know, we just had breakfast. Why is lunch so early in the morning? Yeah. And then if the kids don't eat later in the day, they get really tired. And who's going to pay for that snack? Is a school going to provide the snack? 
does the teacher have to provide the snack because she knows their students need it? Are the parents going to provide the snack? No, uh, right. the parents are not going to provide the snack steadily. So that's that hurts learning and teaching. And normally teachers will end up paying out of their pocket for food in the classroom so they can give their kids a snack in the afternoon so that they but, can But see, learning. the funny thing about these, this, I, I, it seems small and people might say, why are you making a big deal about that? Because you made it a point, you use this simply as an example of the level of control they have. But I'm saying, you, you, you talk about the failing, which we'll get to the failing of in education uh, across the country. And you wonder why that is. These are educated people who go to school to learn to teach, how can this be so bad? Because sometimes they just don't think this stuff through. The fact that these people who are educated, and this is what they do. This is a, think about whatever you know industry you work in. Say this is the industry I've been working in for fifteen years. I know it code, and it just come up with such harebrained ideas. The fact that they know so much and they don't realize that you send schools kids to school at eight thirty that they probably shouldn't be eating lunch at ten o'clock baffles me. And that should tell you a lot about why we have all these other problems. Christy, what would you like to say? I've never heard of that. And I think that's just a symptom of what happened during COVID is a lot of stuff, parents, even parents that are tuned into their kids were really finding out what was going on in the schools. And I'm assuming is that when you guys kind of launched was after COVID? Yeah, I mean, Tina and I, you know, schools closed March 13th of 2020. In Florida, that's pretty much when all schools closed across the United States. That week was kind of like the week, right? And I just feel like there were some people in America who felt like a punch to the gut. They were like, oh, this is really bad. Like I meet people on Twitter. I think it's all my friends that I've made on Twitter, honestly, that were just the people that were like, mm, no, this isn't good. This isn't normal. This isn't right. We're not making decisions in a, a, the right way. Um, science isn't um, taking, we're not looking at the forced masking. We're not really looking at who COVID is affecting when we're making decisions. I think parents just cried foul on it. And we're like, no, this is so, this is so counterintuitive to everything that we know our children need and kids get sick. Right. And so um, I think we just watched as the, we really, Tina and I say, um, when we served on school board, we saw behind the education curtain, like the Wizard of Oz. We got to see behind the curtain. And then COVID happened. And then all of America got to see behind the curtain. Moms all, all over America who were like you, who weren't involved in school board, all of a sudden your kid's on a laptop at your at your you know kitchen table. And you're like, I'm sorry, what, what are you doing? Or like, you can't write. You, you're look at the way you're holding a pencil, like because I mean I don't know about you, Christy, but you know what? My kids in public school weren't getting a lot of homework. I wasn't seeing a lot of the information coming home. Do you think parents are still paying attention, or do you think most of them have been lulled, kind of back to sleep? I think parents are still paying attention to uh, a degree because of some how egregious some of the violations are. Um, I think you know the gender stuff normal everyday parents that are hearing about this, that there are conversations that a teacher would think that they would be allowed to have with their child in a private classroom uh, or a private room, right? About like, what names do you want to use at school? What name do you want us to use with your parents? I mean, like do that to my kid and find out, mess around and find out with me about that. <laughs> For real though, like the, you know, what bathroom do you want to use? Where do you want to sleep when you go on field trips? What pronouns? And knowing what we know about how a child who begins following down the path of social gender transition can go into medical gender transition, what that path looks like, how quickly it accelerates, um, you know, that is egregious. And so you've got court cases happening all over the country on an issue that really is the red flag to American parents saying that the government is telling your kids sometimes that home is not safe. And that they know better than you as the parent. And at Moms for Liberty, we say every parent has a fundamental right to direct the upbringing of their child. That includes their education, their medical care, their morality, their religion. And the government does not give you these rights and they cannot take them away. That's true. And we just need to stand in that. So so you and Tina met after the, the COVID lockdowns. So when did uh, your the, the problems and the insight extend beyond that 
to the race and the gender and all of the other things because I I know there's been um uh alarm around those things so it's always been a part of it Charles okay. Tina uh Tina's son uh when he was in seventh grade he's now in college and uh finishing up college he when he was in seventh grade he did a wanted poster and Christopher Columbus was on the wanted poster that he was assigned to do at school. So, oh, right. and we're talking about, yeah. So, you know, the, it's not like this is some manufactured outrage. This has been a steady uh, indoctrination that has built in the schools over time. Mm -hmm. And it is meant to divide us as people in America. Right. And, and it's important you say, because uh, we'll get to, like I said, we'll talk about some of the, the uh, accusations against you and the things of that nature. But what's important, I, I try to put things in a non-political, very simple uh, um, form for people to understand because I, I try to, because the goal is to get people to understand what's going on. Some people, like Christy was saying, are in the dark and they just don't know. You'd be surprised that you, you'll see me I on Twitter know. constantly I saying Twitter's not real, know. right? I'm always saying Twitter's not real because people will do a poll, have these conversations like, yeah, see, people get it. I'm like, yeah, the 80% of you few people on Twitter, but in the, in the real world, I talk to people in the real world and, you know, they're less understanding of what's going on. They need to know. And I so had no idea, Charles. I had no idea. Even on school board, I look back at things that came before me. And now knowing what I know, I'm like, Ugh. right. You should have seen see it. it. I wasn't looking for that. I didn't think I didn't think that the government was going to be working against me as mm. an American citizen. I just didn't come to running for school board or doing any of this thinking that the government will be weaponized against the American people in the way that it has. I didn't. I but never in a way it's good and it's bad that people don't get it because it's, it's unfortunate as much as it's been in the media and as bad as it's gotten, the, the fact that you're an adult with kids in school and you don't know what's going on, that is a problem. I give you that. But the good thing is when we see it, the way we see it in the media and we see this big fight about it and you see, you know, clips of people on, on liberal media or at school boards or, you know, articles saying, it's not that bad. What's wrong with it? Kind of like um, saying that what the schools are doing is good. You could start to believe that most people be believe that, but you find out that you, because you look around and you say, we're the, a small group of people fighting against it. Why isn't it a larger group of people? So maybe they agree with them. It's really just that no one's gotten to them yet. You know, Moms for Liberty has no What are you going to, Charles, yet. what are you going to do? When you're a mom and you're zoned for a school that is failing and you go to bed at night, every night realizing that your kid is being failed every day when they go to school and you have no other options, you don't have the money to take them out and put them somewhere else. You don't have the freedom to put them in a, into a different school unless you move. Mm -hmm. there, there is no, that is, that is criminal. Right. What we are doing to American mothers. No. And then when they we dare to speak out, we're domestic terrorists because we're upset about the fact that our schools are failing. Right. You know, I mean, there are people who have a lot of issues with school choice. I get it. There are some concerns that I think are valid, but I will not stand in front of a burning schoolhouse and tell a mom, you can't leave. I'm not going to give you the opportunity to get your kid out. I've, I've, I'm traveling around the country. I'm hearing stories from moms all over the country who are moving just in, in in states where they don't have the opportunity to get their kid out just to get their child into a better school. What do you say to the people who don't think that's true? Who think that we're making all this stuff up? I don't, I, I don't know. I guess they need to wake up and travel around a little bit and start talking to other people outside of their, their town. Right. Or city. So, I don't know what to say. So Tiffany, I'm in Arizona and I think I'm in like ground zero for everything. So <laughs> on one hand, we have a great school choice. We have a great, you know, the, the money goes with the kid. I've both homeschooled my kids and now they're like, mom, I want one's like, I want to go to public school. The other one's like, I want to go to a charter school. So I really believe in, in all of the above approach and Arizona allows one to do that. I'm also in an area where Paul Bixler, I'm sure you know who he is, right? Is you don't you haven't heard of him? He is um, a school board member who is transgender. Um, yeah. So and that's literally I can drive twenty minutes and I'll be you know right at his house. So I'm really at ground zero for everything. 
I'm running for school board and I Good went for you. because there's an, open, there's an open seat. So I actually went for an interview to fill that seat. Good for you. Um, and I'm probably not going to get it after this interview airs. Thanks, Charles. But I'll just say it anyways. I'll hold oh, it no. until you win. You'll we'll get hold it, it until You'll you get win. It. We're coming. <laughs> Tina's coming to Arizona on September 14th to do a town hall that I would, we would love to invite you to. This is my formal invitation. I will connect you, but <laughs> you, you don't understand. 70% wow. of the country is with us. 70% of the country knows what is happening is not acceptable. So I'm at a table with mostly Repub actually all Republicans um, interviewing to fill a vacant seat. And one of the questions was, do you think the transgender issue is overblown? Hmm. So do you think even a lot of maybe conservatives maybe don't quite? You know, I think that's a great question. Uh, I was watching The Five the other day on Fox and Jessica Tarloff said to Greg Gutfeld, uh, only 300 girls have had top, minors under the age of 18 have had top surgery in the past year. And Greg Gutfeld was like, only 300? Really? You're talking <laughs> about healthy women, healthy girls who will be able to nurture their babies with their breasts at some point if they choose to have children. And at the age of 13, 14, 15, I never thought I would have wanted to have four kids. Like, and I have four. And so, no, I don't think it's overblown. I think if there is any healthy young woman who is cutting off her body parts in service of trying to change something that is impossible to change, no matter what you do, then it's one too many. So overblown, I don't know. I think they want to know whether, I think they're, the people are testing the waters. I just don't think this is an issue you test the waters on. I think it's very clear. There is there, you know, there is there are two sexes and there are a, a small group of people who fall into uh, an intersex place where we need to have compassion for them. I've met a couple people, actually. I think it's a very difficult thing and that you're challenged with in life. And the people that I've met are wonderful people um, who have wanted their condition to be taken seriously and not to be um kind of invalidated by this social contagion that we've seen sweep through our country. So, you know, is the Republican Party testing the waters on the issue in your area? Maybe. I just don't think this is like a lukewarm place to be. You either think there are two biological sexes and it's wrong to try to affirm mental distress in children, or, you know, you lie to kids and you sterilize them and they can't be parents ever in their life and, you know, maybe never have an orgasm. Like, I don't really feel there's a lot of gray area. I'd like to take issue with something Christy said. Christy said that Arizona's ground zero for all this stuff. Does she realize I'm in New York City? You know, you know, <laughs> Tiffany earlier was talking about being on the school board, not even seeing this stuff because you don't even realize how much you don't know and all these things they do behind the parents' back and all that. Yep. You don't have that problem in New York. Cause they he put it in emails. I get emails from the school saying we are proud to announce that we're going to indoctrinate your kid. We are proud to announce that we're going to teach the colored kids differently because oh. they're black and they don't, and they don't learn the same way. They put it in emails. I wow, heard about Rand. Up. I I interviewed Natalia Morocco today, uh, Apple to Zucchini on Twitter, and she was telling me about Randall Field. She said that Randall Field is being it's like a tent city now. And so none of the rest and, of oh, you, that's that's that's, that's four days old. Now they got like four cities, including one place in Staten Island. There's a thousand people out there protesting it every day. And now you'll love this part though. Now the mayor and the governor are fighting now because it's gotten so bad that they can't Good. just hide behind the Democrat thing. So Eric Adams is saying. You need to do something. We've we've reached our max. We can't handle any more people. And the governor's like, well, you need to send them the rest of the state. And the governor said, no, I can't do that. I can't send them anywhere else. The God, but, but of course, they, they, no one's saying, let's stop them from coming in. I'm coming to New York City to do a town hall because I really think New York parents' voices have been drowned out. Well, when are you coming? I'm from New York. When are you um, I want to do it the beginning of December. I'm working on it right now. All right. Then let me know. You know I'm here. And uh but what, what, what he said he was going to do, he was going to send the migrants to the governor's mansion. 
I got yelled at for calling them migrants today. I went on Steve Bannon and I said migrants and someone wrote me an email and they were like, it's illegal immigrants. Stop using the left's terminology. Yeah, I don't do that either. I just I just happened to say it that one time. I, I don't yes. know. But I mean, not. you have people flooding our country to have a better life. And it's so true. I mean, they have so much more opportunity here than they do where they're coming from. And then you have American people who are like trashing their country every single day. It's just ridiculous. We're so blessed to have the opportunity to live together in the way that we do. Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's shocking that that they they're looking at it like we we don't know what to do. I mean, what do you what do you mean you don't know what to do? You can't just let everybody in. You just can't. You right? can't. It's not a border policy. That's just that's just not a border. And so now so we've had the school board conversation around about I guess it's my turn. So because I'm on the school board, I'm not running like Christy, I already won. So I'm on the school board here. <laughs> and one of the things that that we're grappling with at the beginning is, as kids go back to school is what to do with the kids of these people who come over. Right. They don't have They're... enough resources there. And, and oh, the newest one in New York was they they had a, a press conference yesterday or the day before. And they asked them kind of tongue in cheek because they knew the, the answer. Will the, the children who are coming here illegally and starting school have to be vaccinated? Or will we have proof of vaccination? Because they made the other kids do it and they told them, no, they don't need to be vaccinated. Of course not. But of course, the rest of the kids have to be right. Or at least they tried that. I don't think uh, they tried it. They didn't do it. Our moms, I loved our moms in New York. They put um, in Long Island, they, so I'm from Long Island originally. Like that's where I was born. My dad was born in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. um, but um, they, our moms put out all the kids' shoes. They each took a pair of shoes for every child that would leave the school if, if a vaccine mandate was required. Mm -hmm. uh, and they left all the shoes and we have pictures of shoes tied to chain link fences and laid out on the steps of the school to show them that that was the line. There was, that was the line. Masks should have been the line though. That's true. That's Never true. again. Anyone want to go? Hey, Wilfred. Silence. <laughs> and he's on mute. Well, we can't hear you. You might not be on mute. Christy, how old are your oh. kids? Well, I had a child very young, so I have one that's 30. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And then well, I maybe have... you're just old. Why do you have to say you had one when you were very young? She I, have, I, have I have a 17-year-old who's okay. a senior, and then I have a 14-year-old who's a freshman. Okay. I have 18, 15, 13, and 11. One girl, three boys. Nice. Seven. Well, I have Seven. a question Seven. because... Oh, nice. I'm pretty new to Twitter. I've been active on Twitter for about a year. And so when I first, maybe a little bit longer, when I first came on Twitter, it was an interesting, uh, my introduction to Moms for Liberty was over you guys being racist. And it was, <laughs> it was the heated discussion between a Black woman who is part of your organization and yeah. everyone else who we're just piling on because they assume that you guys were racist. So was it was it Tia? I don't think it was Tia. Was it Tia? Oh, was it? I don't know. Tia, no. I, I don't want to name names. Oh, so I, I, I won't most, name because I was going to say who I don't, thought it was. It so, wasn't Tia. It wasn't I, I think I know who it was. No, you're fine. Um, <laughs> so we've Somebody only, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, you know, I, um, I tried to uh, make a lot of friends. But I also understand that we make our our organization has made room for lots of different parents from the beginning of our start because we're very focused on parental rights. Our mission statement is um, we're fighting for the survival of America by unifying, educating and empowering parents to defend their parental rights at all levels of government. And so that makes room for a lot of different parents. And so I think there's been an effort to marginalize us. And to try to make it seem like I know, you know, all of the things that they say about us. But the truth is we've been diverse from the beginning of our, our start because it really isn't about anything other than being a parent. And we all share that commonality, which brings us together. I think in, in I mean, there's nothing more important than, to me than my children. And so, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I just wanted to say that, like, we get like anti LGBTQ. We've got a lot of lesbian chat. We've got a lot of lesbian moms. I'm not going to lie. We've got a few really strong chapter chairs who are very frustrated with the uh, 
with the whole transgender movement and a lot of the drag queen stuff and all of that and the sexualization of children being um being put on on the on the LGBTQ community, they don't feel like it's a community anymore. I mean, I talk to them about it. They're like, that's not part of who I am as a person. Like, don't I don't ever want to be lumped into that, the sexualization of kids, which unfortunately is happening. Um I guess what I wanted to go to next, what I was going to mention before, but since you mentioned brought it up about that, one of the things, because you know, uh, one of the things I appreciate about you is that you are you will go anywhere, as you mentioned before, talk to anyone about what you're doing and what you believe. You don't shy away from any conversations. We've never talked, you know, until today, but we, you know, chatted via DM on Twitter a couple times. And one of the things that I, I, I and I can see you try to be understanding because this is once this thing, January 21, in two years to be as big as it is now. Uh, I don't know if we can get into whether you expected it to grow that fast, but I there's going to be pains along the way. It's like hard to manage all that stuff. You didn't start off thinking you were going to manage all these people and all this sort of stuff. But one thing I will say, you talk about the diversity and all that, but but you know that there's a lot of parents out there who agree with you, who have problems with this stuff as they find out what's happening. So one of the, th the things I was questioning and, and you and I talked about briefly was the fact that you have been pigeonholed as this right-wing organization and i know a lot of the people that i know being in new york that are pushing back against this stuff that and I, my thing has always been and because the full disclosure i'm not knocking it even if you are because i'm a conservative but my thing is just like i say we can't legislate our way out of all of our problems because they're cultural we can't really win them with only people on the right right so so some people would never listen to me say something even if i have all the facts behind me but when somebody who who's they deem a liberal says the same thing then it makes sense because you're not a crazy right winger so to that do you think it's been I, i'm assuming it's not intentional but do you think it's somewhat um uh limiting by the, the well if it's a label it's just a label but but would you say that most of the people are more conservative leaning and is it a problem i didn't register as a republican until 2016 i wanted to vote in the primary in florida in 2016 and you have to be registered in your party to vote in the primary so i have never been a very political person i didn't grow up in a political family the majority of our members have never been political to be honest with you gotcha. but um I'm, ali bestucky spoke at our summit one of the one of the biggest statements that was really impacted me since we started the organization was she said politics matter because policies matter because people matter and people matter and policies affect people and the way you change policies that are hurting people is by getting involved in politics that's just the bottom line. And so like Christy's running for school board, that's how you get involved. That's how you have your voice heard. If you feel like the things that are happening around you in your community are not good and taxpayer dollars are being spent to change the culture and the climate of your community, then you have to get involved and have your voice heard and make change happen. Um, you know, people say a lot of things about us. I don't know. I just... I think that if nobody was talking about us, then that would mean that we weren't very effective because right. we would be nothing. But everybody's talking about us and we're really up in the teachers union's heads. And I'm happy about that because we that means that we're being effective. Right. So I don't know. I'm willing, you know, Gavin Newsom sent out a really nasty email about me. <laughs> uh, he clipped a portion of our summit, like 20 seconds from a speech that I gave that was like 15 minutes long. Right. to our membership. It was like a private dinner that I we do, but I had no problem with it being shown publicly. Um, I didn't say anything that I was ashamed of um, because I support these moms. They're learning, they're advocating, they're growing, and everybody's looking to take a shot at them right. and to hurt them and to make them look stupid or bad. And, you know, no, um, no, I, I, I get that. My money's I, and I on understand them. the, imp the importance <laughs> of policy, but but you can craft policy without just being Republican. Yeah, I don't know where are the Democrats, Charles. Where are they? <laughs> I think at this point you've scared them all away. But I think it's ridiculous. Now RFK said he would speak at our summit, and then he pulled out at yep, the last yep. minute. Now um, I was disappointed in that. I really there were votes in in that room for him. Um, listen, our moms are not political. Somebody said, well, what do you, what do you, what are you going to say? Like to people, you know, only Republican candidates speak at your events. We invited every single Democrat that was running for president and no, and none of them came. 
That's so, actually one of the questions I had prepared. So you've done outreach to Democratic political candidates and they've just yes. all said no? Yes. In fact, yeah, they have. I'm about to have a town hall in 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 Maryland. So uh, the governor there can be on notice. He He's about to get an invitation. We'll see if he'll show up and answer questions from parents. Hmm. Yeah, I don't really have a follow up to that, but that's something that we've talked about on this show a couple of times. Just the there's this constant question of why don't the parties do outreach beyond their bases? And we've talked, for example, on the other extreme to I think, Charles, it was Bart Talia Farrow, former deputy mayor of Philly, happens to be an African-American guy. All right. And right. You, Nick. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he's, he said a lot of wild stuff, too. But I mean, one of the comments black politicians will often say is like, we've tried to do outreach to the GOP. We've tried to set up events with them. Um, and they've often just said no or not come okay. or sent the press secretary. Here's and it's crazy thing. to hear the reverse, this diverse group of moms where the Democrats are just like, nope, nope, they're yes, all no. Nazis. But here's the thing that you don't understand. The Republicans do it to us, too. Really? When we started Moms for Liberty, there is the establishment Republicans that have the clubs. And it's like. And, and Chris, uh, maybe Christy knows, <laughs> like Susie's going to run and then Susie's husband's going to run and then right her husband. So like they, they just think they have everything mapped out about what's going to happen. And then we show up and we're like, hey, we've got some ideas. We'd like to talk to you about these elections. We know, it, you know, some places they're partisan, some places they're nonpartisan. But here's what we stand for. We're very focused on issues. And they're like, you see my like competition for funding. <laughs> really? Like, oh. honestly, no. So, you know, I was never a member of like my REC locally. I got kicked out once. I could tell you that story. Mm. My daughter was told that she should be ashamed to have me as a mother. And they invited me back like a, a year and a half later to speak uh, after starting Moms for Liberty because apparently, you know, they realized there was some value in what we were doing. But I don't think it's just the Democrats. I think it's just establishment in general political establishment in America that does not like outsiders like Vivek or like Trump or like somebody that's not like of the political cloth. And the majority of our moms have never been political. They well, nobody, that, they, nobody owns them. That, that I think is the extreme anger toward not just Trump, but toward RFK, for example, toward a lot of people, Bernie Sanders, where I mean, elections were basically rigged to knock him out. If you look at the South Carolina primary, it's the idea that you're disrupting someone's year, kind of like this is going to be Hillary's year, but she's got to go up against Bernie and then Trump. And there was that skinny black guy back in the day. So, yeah, there's a lot of anger about that in establishment political circles. I, I agree. So what do you think is your, uh, I mean, I'm sure you had a lot of them in such a short period of time, but like the biggest successes and the biggest wins you've had. Um, we endorsed in over 500 races in 2022 for school board and we won uh, over half of those. And the big, the, the biggest thing that makes me happy is that 76% of all of the candidates endorsed had never run for political office or held political office before. Wow. And that to me means that you have a whole new group of people like me or like Christy, Christy, I'm assuming you've never held political office before. No. Yeah. And I hadn't either. And when I ran, people were like, well, like, what are your qualifications? I'm like, I'm a mom and a taxpayer. <laughs> you like, you all notice I keep things. getting snubbed. She keeps saying like me and like Christy. I'm sorry, Charles. <laughs> well, you're, Charles. you're not a mom though, Charles. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like I'm not, yeah. not a mom either. Oh yeah, what about that? Why does it have to be mom for liberty? To... Charles, why, why, why tell me about your liberty? school board. How many people are on your school board? Uh, how many are on my board? Twelve. Yes, twelve. It's New York's got a million people. students. New York is a huge. You're forgetting New York is a whole different animal. Okay, yeah, but so so who are, ultimately, only... who do you hire? What are you responsible for in the org chart? You hire and fire who? Uh, who do I hire and fire? Yeah, like the school board has the responsibility to hire who? Who do you do reviews on for evaluation? Oh, like review. I mean, like, you know, uh, can you fire the mayor? Because uh, you could. I would no, like principal, to fire superintendent, him. stuff like that. No, not the mayor. So, you know, I, I would love to have you on the podcast to talk about the structure of the New York City School Board. I, here's the thing. School boards across the country are so different. Oh, like, what Christy, what's your school board situation like? How many people went on the board you're running for? Actually, I was going to ask you about that because it's separated. So there's the primary school um, school board and then there's the high school. 
And so I'm registered to run for the high school because I have high schoolers and I understand those issues, but the vacant seat was for the primary. So that's what I interviewed for three months ago and they still haven't made a decision. <laughs> but that's How many another- people interviewed? Four. Okay. And the way I interviewed was kind of, kind of interesting. I'll tell you that on the, on the back end. I kind of okay. got it. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. I'm happy to help. We're about to launch a new campaign toolkit for school board uh, candidates. Um, one of the things that Tina and I recognized when we ran for school board and uh, Charles, I'll send you a picture of, I think I've posted it before on Twitter, like how I started and it's me with the four kids and we have all these signs around us, like justice for school board. Right. Like it was very, we're very grassroots, even though nobody wants to admit that. Um, yes. But it's very hard to, I mean, Christy, I, you, Charles, I don't know what your run was like, but, you know, depending on where you are, you don't have a lot of campaign consultants that want to happy, help you with your race. And so you're kind of fumbling through the dark for information about like, how much money do you need to raise? How many doors do you need to knock? What kind of information do you need to get out? Right. How are you going to budget your campaign? And we're about to launch a toolkit that uh, a woman that on our executive team, Marie Rogerson, has worked on with another woman, Jessica Graham. This really is going to change the ability and the way that people run for school board so that you'll be able to have a much more effective and organized campaign. Because I just felt like when I was running, it was like grab, you know, we didn't have the Obama community organizing. My campaign manager was actually a guy who had worked on Obama's campaign in my county. Um, because they were so good on the ground with grassroots and getting out and speaking to people. And that's what Tina and I are doing. I mean, if people say like, oh, you're an activist, you're an advocate, I think I'm a community organizer. Um, You know, I think that's what every, that that's what we need right now is really, we are truly grassroots and it's all about getting people involved and engaged to run for school board. And Charles, when I'm in DC and stuff and I see people at meetings, I'm always like, they're always like, what can I do? What should we be doing? I'm like, you should go back to where you live and run for something. (laughs) Like that's literally the most important thing that you can do. Take what you're doing for the whole country and then make sure you're like, you know, feeding it back into where you live. That is definitely important. So what does Mod for Liberty, what what do you all have against uh, Black history? (laughs) Nothing. I want children to learn accurate Black history. Everything, the good, the bad, it's American history. It's just not with history. books because you want the books banned, right? I'm I mean, just running down the list. How I, many Tiffany, rape scenes? I gotta go. On Monday night, I went to my home county school board meeting uh-huh. with John M. and Chukwu, my friend who came to visit me, and our chapter chair and people from my community. And there's a new law, uh, SB 1069 in Florida, that says that if you read the school, if you read at the school board meeting, if you read a passage from a book and they cut you off because of content, then the book has to be removed. And so the very, very, very smart, wonderful Jennifer Pippin, who's the chapter chair of my Indian River County Moms for Liberty uh, chapter, uh, printed out slips of the excerpts from the books that had been already voted to be put back on the bookshelf. So they've been questioned once by that school board and those school board members, and those people put them back on the shelf just so that everyone realizes this is the second time around and Jennifer brought the fire and she gave the passages out to people and she asked them to get up and speak. And adults were horrified to hear passages where like the majority of the passages were about adults raping minor children. Like internal dialogue of a girl getting raped where she can hear the headboard and she hears crying and then she realizes it's her. Like, why are we paying for this crap in our school? Right. Some mom uh, got up passed, and was like, maybe if kids are getting effect? raped, it's helpful to them. I'm like, really? That's that's how we help like uh, sexual assault victims is throwing a book on a library shelf. It's but pathetic. Tiffany, when did this law go into effect? Uh, that was signed in a law in June, that latest one, 1069. We're just improving oh. upon it as we go. Oh, OK. Wow, that's crazy. So, th- so because of that, they, did they did they cut her off? Yeah, they well, the school board chair didn't know what to do. Because if she cut her off, then the, the book got removed. Go. Right. But then if she didn't cut her off, then the she other was parents condoning. Would get irate. So she was condoning, like every adult in the room was like horrified. Even the people who were there who thought they were against us were coming up and were like, my 13 year old has never heard things like this. And John Amichukwu, to his credit, was like, then, like, why aren't you standing with us and supporting us right. and getting the books removed? Well, they can now because the book's on the shelf in the school. I, 
Right. Yeah. I mean, she got right? like 30 books removed. It was pretty, I was pretty, um, it was pretty badass move. I'm not going to lie. I, I don't know what to say about that, but I, you know, I think the chapter chair of Moms for Liberty in my county, it rocks. She's like, so she was one of the original was, two. What, what, go ahead. Were you going to say something, Will? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that one of the more valid questions that people ask about this is, couldn't this standard be used against most literature? Like the stereotypical example was the Bible. But I mean, like I read one of the great Civil War books today, um, The Killer Angels, and they were talking about, you know, cannonballs blowing people's intestines out of their sides and people wading through pools of blood that were a foot deep. And I find that in America, we tend to be a little more prudish about sex than men killing each other for whatever reason. But I mean, yeah, do you, you think- know what? I'll tell you what. I'm not a prude. No, I'm not I saying am, I'm no, not, no, no, I, no, no, no. Wait, let me finish. I assume most moms have some non prudish moments when you think about it. Thank you. But no, I mean, yeah, but, I, mean we know how, I know, I know how it happens, sir. Thank you very much. Four no, but, times. No, no, so, I, I, listen, I know, no, 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 but listen. Could I finish rape, the question here? Rape. Yeah, you can. I'm going to be, uh, you can ask your question. So, yeah, the, the question, and I, I'm not trying at all trying to be rude. I'm just saying that in yeah, terms let's of have it. any good, in terms of most books about war, sex education, I mean, and obviously there is a place for sex education in school. I think 80% of Americans agree on that. So couldn't you read through most passages? I mean, the classic awkward, the penis goes into the vagina where this goes on for five pages and so on and have the school board ask you to stop. I mean, would you remove every book from a library where that could happen? Like would the red badge of courage be taken out and so on? That's a, that's a sincere question. We're talking about the rape of children by adults in books that have been published in the last 15 years, sir. Sure, but what about, uh, say, books about the Holocaust? If a school board were to stop reading about people's fat melting off of their feet and so on, would you want that taken out of the library? Um, we were talking about the rape of minor children. Sure, Sometimes but that, uh, by teachers in some of the passages. Here's what I'll say to you. That actually doesn't oh, no, really no, 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 respond no, no, no. to the question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you the link sure. to the school board meeting, and okay. then you can watch it. And okay. then you can, you and I can have this conversation again because you're sure, coming but- at this from a uh, very interesting, uh, somewhat misinformed perspective. I don't, I don't think I'm misinformed at all. I read uninformed, the book today. uninformed, some might say. Well, I mean, I literally just and read the book. I it's- am willing to have this conversation sure, with you. I'm more than willing to talk to you. After all. you can, after you listen to the school board meeting and you watch the interaction and you see that adults sitting on a school board were not comfortable having language said to okay. them, which is contained in books that are sure. in a public li- a public school library. But what's the answer to the Print question, the book, though? If, if adults the book, weren't, write the book, sell the book, put it in the public library. If adults weren't comfortable with language about the Holocaust, should the book be removed? Um, we're talking about the rape of minor of mine that's the example that you're sometimes using. I'm, I'm by ask- teachers no no no. it's not the example i'm, I'm asking a somewhat different the question vast if majority adults of the excerpts of the books that were read listen i know it's a lovely argument that you're trying to make i'm just not I'm willing to engage with pretty, you it's dishonest it's a disingenuous it's conversation i'll send you the link to the meeting and then you and i can speak about the the books that were signed. okay i mean i don't think i'm gonna get an answer and i've enjoyed talking to you overall but i mean i do th- i'll just make you got that- an answer you just don't you're just not getting the answer you want well, I'm. I haven't gotten an answer to the question. I, I will say so. The the final point I would make about this, because overall the conversation sure. is going well, is just make the I think there are many books about war, sex, so on that would upset many people. But, Friends but, of mine from but, Rwanda but, would certainly object to a book about that conflict. But to that okay. point, Will, the, the, the other problem. But 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 to that point, Will, the other problem that comes in is when we get into, and I get what you're trying to say, yeah. but when we get into the what the overarching thing in the media is about, these people are banning books. Oh yeah, of course they're not just banning books. Right, no, there's a difference between point. banning books and just saying I don't want to have that. So so to to answer your question, if if I wouldn't say that they should do that, but if the school decided, we, no, we don't want that book, whether it's Holocaust, the Bible whatever they say we don't want that book in school you can disagree right but that's not the same as banning the book for the school to say we're not going to have it in our library that's actually a completely valid answer and that that's right. kind of why i was asking so there, there are levels here like there's there's a second that charles local... that was a good answer he liked that answer well i mean i, I could like your <laughs> and, answer and I as think, well but, but... But one quick, I mean, I'm sorry, go ahead, finish, Will. I'm sorry. No, no, yeah. But I mean, so there's an element where there's a considerable extent to which local provisional democracy in a world where most ultimate morals aren't real local is a good thing. Democracy. Yes, that's He's what a professor, English. Tiffany. For that's literally what it's Break it, called. Like I'm five. Tell it to me like I'm five. No, no. I mean, 
None of you guys are five. What I'm saying is that whether or not it's ultimately good, if people in a local environment want to vote on something and say, nah, we don't want that around here, that's often no one else's business. But the question is sort of what would people do? I mean, for example, what would an entirely black radical school board vote to remove from their schoolhouse? <laughs> And, I mean, and again, I think, that's insulting to, I think that's insulting to the majority of people when you say that. What I'm talking about is explicit graphic sexual content in books that have put in, been put into libraries that really have no educational value. And, and what you're talking about is, is perhaps an, an elective process where you have people serving in office that have a difference of opinion in the way that and, and, and the community is going to have to grapple well, with that. That's happening now. You said there were books taken out of this single library and every time. No, it's that... the entire district. So you don't even know what you're talking about. You just said from that library, there are 30 books. Yeah, I mean, so it's, like, dude, it's the entire district. OK, let's let's have a question and answer. How many books do you think are in the entire library system? In the I have no idea how many books See, are but in you the don't entire know. library so system. I'm, you just I'm said how many. You, this I'm is willing not to have a back and forth. We're owning each other kind of situation. My point no, was very I'm willing simple. to have the conversation with you when you, you come to the, the table same thing with the right facts and times. information. My point is that a lot of All books right. on basic sex ed, a lot of books on basic warfare could no very likely about. be taken out of districts. I know exactly what I'm talking about. I've seen how people have voted about what kids okay, should be to in the past, like professionally for papers I've written. So maybe okay. uh, Tiffany, <laughs> Tiffany, maybe he's saying then, then uh, another example uh, for that: you I'm take sex and, and violence, take the sex and violence out, and say, what if um, uh, a more conservative um, school area, a school district in a more conservative area, wanted to remove all of the anti-racist books? From, from a library. Because... Listen, I'm not, but that's not the conversation that I'm having. I'm speaking mm -hmm. about a specific situation where I'm talking about explicit graphic content. I'm willing to have hypothetical conversations with you. Do you go by Wilfred or Ed? How do I, how do I speak? Um, I obviously don't go by Ed. I usually go by Will. I, I think Will? you know that because you you said hey to me at the start of the show. No, so, I yeah, just I get... didn't know you. I, I thought I heard him say Ed. I apologize. Oh, no, no, yeah, no, it's totally Will, fine. Yeah, I, I'm what I'm Will. saying is, is that in this instance, I'm talking about a specific group of books where excerpts were read okay. and the content and, and, the, and the school board chair chose to stop the reading. And what mm -hmm. I'm saying to you is, is that the vast majority of the books were rape of minor children, sometimes by teachers. All 30 of them? Almost. And I'll get you all the excerpts. Don't you worry. I'm going to send you the, the yeah, link sure. to the I'll, meeting I'll right after we finish. But- I'm willing to have conversations about hypotheticals about the idea of removing content. Like, let's have that conversation. Let's mm -hmm. be specific about what we're talking about, right? In the same meeting that we were in, there was a conversation about the benchmark characteristic in the Florida African-American history curriculum about the fact that slaves may have benefited from skills that they learned while in slavery. Mm -hmm. And that conversation was happening in the same school board meeting. You'll see that. I'm willing mm. to engage in all of these conversations. Okay. But what I'm not willing to do is have a disingenuous or a dishonest conversation but about a specific there's situation nothing that I'm talking about. about You're this. asking I'm not me saying to opine about something. You're asking me, meeting. I was speaking about a specific situation. Okay. And you're asking me to opine very broadly about- well, I asked you to give your opinion on a specific. So this policy says if a school board objects to something in a text, that book will be removed from a library. Yeah. And I pointed out, and by the way, I didn't just sort of make up my ideas. I mentioned a couple categories of things like basic sex ed and military violence that a majority okay, what of about, parents what in about the past peanut butter have and jelly to. being served in the cafeteria? Let's just add that in too. I'm just going to add that, that in. It has nothing to do with the, the exactly what we're talking about, which is that a lot of parents object to basic sex ed, any of the critical theories. Parents can normally opt out of sex ed, to be honest with you, if they want yes, to. Yes, but that, that's the question. Should the books English be in the library? Which like is, again, is in Montgomery County, Maryland right now. Sure, but if, if there's a, ba yeah, that's a, that's a good legal citation. But I mean, if there's a basic marriage manual in the school library, that includes illustrations of sex that are not pornographic by any normal standard, and parents object to that. Should it? Why be is there a manual showing sexual positions in a public school library? Because it's a high school and there's sex education in the school. The question of whether what? parents should be able Can to you remove... show? Do you have this book? What book is this? Do I have books that show sexual positions? Probably. Yeah. I mean, you yes. Think the I... Kama Sutra. 
do you think the Kama Sutra I wouldn't put the Kama Sutra in a public school library? No, although it's in my college library. But like we're talking about bo- the, that's the only book that pops into my mind that has like that we've mentioned between position. the Red Badge of Courage and the Kama Sutra. <laughs> so the question is, you would courage. remove all of them. Argument, I would dude. remove some Whatever. of them, I'm maybe. Done. This is so this is so, you like, haven't answered the like, question. Like honestly, you if, just if brought up the red badge of courage. Voted. Okay. Was that because of war? Can the we move on to a ridiculous it's, conversation? No, but I mean, I'm like kind of joke. I do. Is the Kama Sutra going to be in a middle school library is also kind of a joke. The basic point that Mom's oh my gosh, for Liberty you're is not the... removing books for no okay. reason. Okay, is valid. No one's removing like them when you no look reason. at like gender queer, for example, uh-huh. obviously the books being challenged in large part are not like Archie and Jughead go to the mall. The question that I asked, which I figured I'd get an answer to, was how broadly does any parent can challenge a book? And if the school board wants the reading to stop, the book is removed from the library. Go. Would that what apply did, when, to, when, for example? What did Benjamin, who was it that said you have a republic if you can keep it? That was Benjamin Franklin who said that? I uh, believe so. It was him or Jefferson. Probably yeah, Franklin. I think it was Franklin. I think it was Franklin, Franklin who yeah, said you Franklin. have a republic if you can keep it. So my answer back to you is this. Mm-hmm. Do we have common sense in America? Are we going to encourage people with common sense to run for local elected office so that they can make common sense decisions? Because no, sir. We should not be removing things because someone gets sad or their feelings get hurt. My issue is that we Mm -hmm. treat adults like children and children like adults. We treat adults like children, like they need safe spaces and every word hurts them. And we treat adults and children like adults because we're sexualizing them and introducing them to content that they don't need to know about in elementary school. And so to be honest with you, I thought the school board chair was ridiculous. I thought there were things that she stopped people on. I thought John Amichuku, when he was talking, and I think, I don't, this is a late night program, so I'm gonna go there. Um, he, yeah. I think in the first sentence, he said something about someone getting fingered. Like, I thought that was one of the tamest things I had actually heard all night. And the school board chair shut him down because I don't know why, to be honest with you. She let have, she should have kept, let him kept reading, keep reading. But yeah. you're going to have to, we're going to have to work as a society to elect people who are going to make good decisions in our communities. And we're going to have to have more conversations about collectively what we hold to be like common things like age appropriateness, for example, which like until apparently like two years ago, we all collectively as a country believed in like, there are certain things that are for adults and certain things for kids. And we like had movie ratings and explicit right. content warnings and all that jazz. We used to Absolutely. like- that's because I, I, of, the, of the kids we talk about between the three of us, I have the youngest and I can tell you, they give him all kinds of stuff that's not age appropriate. Thank you. Right. Christy, My question- gonna- yeah, my question was, um, Will, do you have kids? No. Okay. So I think I'm just fundamentally- because the way she said it, she said, like, yeah. you have, you don't <laughs> like kids. Okay. I mean, also, like, I oh, think that that's kind of. Let me finish my question. Ugh. Let me finish my question yeah, yeah, yeah. or my statement. So, oh, no, you, the, the, the fact, way she had with the point, I'm sorry. I think the fact that you don't have kids and you also teach adults because you teach at a college. So your expectations for how adults process and handle information. He's a little freaky maybe, too. So don't, yeah, don't throw that <laughs> And maybe not coming from a parental point of view. <laughs> but when my child goes to school, I don't have control over what they get at that library. Right. So this is now the parent's opportunity to say, we need to have control over what they're reading because if they're picking up books that we don't approve of, like we dictate what our kids learn, when they learn it, what material Mm -hmm. they consume. But if they're going to school and they're getting material that we don't deem age appropriate as parents, we have the ultimate say as to when they learn about sex, how they learn about it. And that shouldn't come from libraries at a school. And Will, okay. before you were talking, can I give, give you a yeah, quick... Can I give a... Can I give and a, I think maybe your lack of having children and having that experience Go ahead. might be why this conversation went off the rails. No, I, I actually, I don't think so. <laughs> like, I think that the, the question I asked is actually a pretty legitimate and standard question when people talk about this, which is, if you're saying that the public has the ultimate veto over anything that's well, in a high school or in a public. library, and I mean, you could say parents, whatever subset of the public... 
what does represented that... representatives that are duly elected? They sure, but what office. does the community so... selects them? Sure, but that the idea that if a representative stops reading something that parents read to him, that thing should be removed from a public building. The library board in my town is, if I recall correctly, also elected. That's a standard that is really prone historically as a political scientist to abuse. So I was curious about that, what that would mean in practice. Okay. That's a pretty, that's a very normal and historical question. And one thing no, about the, Wait, wait, wait. Can I actually, can I stop? I, I want to respond to the first, I have a I bit of information. This, I want to respond to the first question. Oh. What, what are you saying here? I wanted to tell you because you joined us late in the conversation. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that you heard this part, huh? um, but all of the books had been reviewed and put been, been put back on the shelf. So um, the fact that them being read in public led the board and the board chair to be so uh, disturbed that she felt the need to stop the reading. Um, you know, I, I mean, I get, I hear what you're saying. I agree with you, but I don't necessarily know you. I, I don't necessarily think you know exactly where we are right now in this country with some of this stuff. I think I have mixed feelings about this, actually. So the question is itself a valid one. But like my first point about this was so obviously when Moms for Liberty's attack for like banning books, that like everything that's said about the right is just bullshit. So like the Ron DeSantis don't say gay bill, I actually asked a left leaning class of my my students about it, and I just broke it down. It was like, so the law says that you can't talk to children who are under eight. One of you guys might correct me. But about sex, sexual orientation, or gender identity, you'd support that or not. I didn't mention DeSantis at all. And like 95% of the people said, yes, I support that. That's just obviously valid. So similarly, like banning the oral sex edition of genderqueer is not book banning in the conventional sense. But at the same time, like I know that if you went to most black or Appalachian communities in Frankfurt and read a gay love story that was primarily asexual, and asked, should this be part of the library au revoir, the chance of that passing muster is really low. Right. So, I just want to be what, clear, what, what, and the I... reading of the books that happened in my school board, it was uh, the majority were men raping minor females. But, but let me say, yeah, that's, can that's, I, can that's, I please... odd that, So, okay, one comment no one's made. It's odd I'm that we're books any... with that theme in the school. Like that's okay. Like I don't know if we're fighting on that one. That's yeah. But right. they, the the but range that's what there I'm is talking about. But here, no, no, let, but me, I mean, let me say something. Real I quick then though. asked a much broader question. But Charles and I'm still then going to respond to Christie's comment. Then, oh, that's fine. But real quick, there's two things I want to add. It's, it's just I want to make sure that we're covering okay. uh, the breadth of this. So it's not a knock on any of the conversations. But one, when 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 Tiffany says the books were, I think that's important when she said the books were okayed and then when they read it, and, and Will's questioning the law, is that okay? Because it's a slippery slope thing, which I understand. Yeah. But, the, but, but the important part of the book being read is what Tiffany's really telling us is that the people who want to put, who's pushing this stuff in the in, in these libraries and in the schools want, made some loud noise, like put this book in the school, and somebody rubber stamped it without actually reading it. So when they heard it, they were shocked by it. They're like, whoa, did I approve this stuff? So that's part of it. And then a second little antidote, that's why I like to, you know, give these real live examples because then it, it kind of changes, it, um, gives you a better perspective of what's happening. And because some of it is the sneakiness of what people are doing. So I, I said, my son is seven in his class. So they have the thing, I think Will mentioned something about opting out. So you can opt out of different types of lessons. Okay. So they'll send you the lessons like, okay, I don't want to do that. Totally fine. See, you can opt out. But what they do, they also have the library in the school because it's elementary school that goes all the way up to 11 year olds, 12 year olds. And then they have classroom books, right? So the classroom books are just on the shelf all over the place. So if they stick books there, they don't have, it's not in the lesson plan, right? So they don't have to send that out. But if somebody just picks the book up off the shelf and reads it, you, you don't get to opt out, out of that because it's just a classroom book. And in the classroom, they have the anti-racist baby, all that kind of stuff. And they had a book about d various gender identities. So they sent a lesson about one issue and I questioned that. And when she was trying to defend that, I said, well, what about this book my son said they read in class the other day? Oh, well, that wasn't part of a lesson plan. It was just a book that some kid picked up. But because the book is there, right, that's how they're using it as a tool. So that's part of the problem with the books being available for, to younger kids. Because you might say, Will might find a book that says, okay, it's right on the border, but maybe it's okay for a fifth grader. But then it gets into uh, the K through three 
uh, third grade class and now they have access to the books. And then the principal's like, well, they never should have had access to the book. So that's part of the problem too. It's this, and that stuff happens and it's done intentionally and they play like it's not. So then the books are in the younger classes and they're like, well, we thought that was just for the older classes. So that's part of the problem too. I, listen, I think there's a valid argument to be made about age appropriateness. I've got four kids, 11, 13, 15, and 18. And the 11 year old has access and in, in information that the 18 year old um, that uh, that doesn't have access to the same information and doesn't get access to the same movies or the same books or the same video yeah. games. Um, and I think most moms who have kids of varying ages have different ages that where things are okay. Like there's, and, and, and it depends on the kid too, because some kids can handle things and other kids that you have, you know, like maybe won't be able to handle it in the same way. And that's truly your discretion as a mom. Um, the problem here is that the government is coming in and they're making decisions for you as a parent. And there's nobody else that gets to do that. Like even when you're a mom and your kids go to the doctor, your pediatrician, you go and you take them to the doctor, but you ultimately are the one making the decision as to whether or not to give them the medication that's being recommended or to do what it is that's being said. But in this situation, like Charles in Montgomery, Maryland, right? Like you've got people that are saying now, like you can't opt your kids out. And there's this information that we're going to be presenting to them. And we think it's in service of them being a better human being. And we don't really care what you think about that. We don't really care if it's in conflict with your religious beliefs. In fact, the judge in Maryland said, um, I think that she did that they didn't see that the mere um, observance of something in the classroom was actually a violation of free religious exercise of the family. And you know, now you're seeing people of all varying belief systems coming together and saying, like, what is going on in this country with the the disdain and the disregard for children, whether it was COVID and lockdowns and the policies that hurt kids, or whether it's the curriculum that we're seeing that we as parents feel is toxic to them and divisive, whether it's about race or religion or about the country or about their gender. There's a lot of messing with the American family and the belief system of American families. And I think mom's our moms are asking like, why, right. why, why are, why are our families being destabilized in this way? Why are our children being destabilized in this way? And by the way, why, where, where do you live? Will? I mean, you don't I have live? to tell me like um, specific, like what state? Yeah, I'm not going to give an address or anything, but I, yeah, I live I in Louisville right now. In, in Kentucky. Okay. Yeah. So do you know what the reading proficiency, what the, like the, the data it looks like in your state as far as kids are concerned? Yeah, most people can't read, just like Bad, most like people everywhere. say. Yeah, that I mean, the, the Kentucky data is, despite uh, some of the banter about the South, it's pretty on par with the USA, but the USA is quite bad. So, yeah, I mean, New in York City of, schools. I mean, well, yeah. New York schools is actually not as bad as some places, but it's still not yeah. great. Um, But yeah, I know it's going down. But th that's the thing. I mean, like we're having a conversation about rape scenes in books. And uh, my question is, why are we spending our tax money on these things? And why are we not putting more focus onto the basics and teaching kids? Well, Tiffany, maybe read. the silver lining is the kids can't read anyway, so they can't read. They the can't, can't read the rape scenes. I mean, to some extent, no, because the, now they make them. Now they make them uh, in um, what's it called with the the gender queer stuff? What's the cartoon? The, the graphic, uh, graphic, yeah, graphic. the graphic novel or whatever. Novels, yeah. So now it's like you know, I mean, you can see great. It's, it's worth noting that the typical urban Kentucky or New York school gets close to thirty thousand dollars per student. So I mean, there's there's plenty of money to go around. Is that the what the is funding is per pupil in Kentucky? It's very close in Louisville or Frankfurt, certainly. Yeah, the, really. And, yeah, it's more than that in New York. How or much Chicago. is it for you, Christy? Do you know? It's a lot less than that. A lot less than that. Exact exact in Florida, it's like 8,000. It's 8,000 yeah. 8, per 8, people in Florida. in Florida. I would have to check that. I mean, I'm sure you're correct, but in no, in, in the urban Midwest, it's a very... Baltimore is like 16,000. Yeah. New York City is like 28. I just didn't know Kentucky was that high. Uh, that's that's, really that's Louisville high. Metro. That's Louisville City and suburbs. And in, in Kentucky, though, it's well over ten or 15,000. It's that's not like a small how amount many of money. private school tuition? I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, it, used that's... To be, it used to be more consistently more than Catholic schools. Let me pull up Chicago and see what we're working with. Chicago was 20. Oh, I don't know what it is. It's it less than 24. New York is. I think it's 26, yeah, maybe 27,400, yeah, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27, $27,
definitely one issue, but the schools have more than enough money to teach reading. But it's I mean, not I, just I the library Latin books. The library AFS. books are such a small facet of it. It's, yes. it's all the consultants and it's all oh, the yeah, SEL yeah. and it's all the excuses for educational failure. And the bottom line is that 95% of kids have the ability to learn to read. I don't care it's what skin color language. they have, mm. what language, I mean, honestly, even what language they come to the school uh, speaking primarily because kids learn language quickly, especially when they're in the public school environment, given the right support. Um, I live in Florida. I've seen it done in schools and done well. So the bottom line is, like, at what point do we start having a conversation about what books should be in the yeah, line? And, and what the over beyond books, what the priorities are. They're prioritizing the wrong thing, and that's why they're failing. I know we're going long, so Tiffany, I want to ask you now that you've gotten, like I said, you know, you you've grown, now that I so fought with Will. Oh, by the if I can say one thing, Louisville is, I was actually a little overestimating. Louisville is only twenty two thousand nine hundred sixty four uh, per pupil. Still, as that's still really yeah. high. I'm shocked, honestly, because yeah, Baltimore is like sixteen. So I'm just yeah. like, they, they, the Kentucky, they got the money. They, they, they the kids. Yeah, the the South is a, a random fact. The South is underrated for families, so on down the line. If talking about race relations, schooling, so on down the line, I would far rather live in Louisville than. Baltimore or Boston. Louisville's also about twice the size of either one of those if you look at the metro. So Arizona's so, ten thousand. Arizona's ten thousand, she said. And still failing. <laughs> so yeah. so well, at least you fell in with 10 and not failing with 25. 25. So, yeah. so, so what's next, uh Tiffany? Um, getting more people elected to school board, helping people, helping moms and dads who want to run figure out how to run and run successfully. Um uh, growth in states. We're at 46 states. We're about to add Utah and Idaho, and then we'll have Rhode Island and uh, Vermont as the last two states where we don't have chapters. Um, and then we've really started working with most, our, all of our growth actually has been very organic up to this part point, but we're now um, bringing on some moms as ambassadors to go into other counties and surrounding areas to start to help chapters, grow oh, chapters. Good. Because what we've seen is that, um, when you get enough chapters in a state, like in Pennsylvania, I think we have like 26. I think in uh, in in, New, in uh, North Carolina, we have like 20. Um, when you get enough chapters in a state and they form in a legislative committee, they're really able to move policy at the state level. And, you know, you're able to really do a lot there and, and create a lot of, of policy that's going to help you to move your your state forward. And the bottom line is this, you know, Will, to your point, good things can happen and bad things can happen. And the best way to ensure that your voice is heard and that good things are happening in your community is for you to get involved and try to make those good things happen. Yeah. And so we just really love the fact that so many people are running for office and um, that we're having vibrant conversations about stuff. You know, there's a lot of stuff yeah. apparently America needs to talk about. Well, you talk about you you were bringing on ambassadors. You need to get uh, you know, give more responsibility to that great uh Tara Reed down in South Carolina. She's uh doing great work down there. I know they flipped their whole board. I, I, she's she's always working. So I, you get yeah, and, like her. and on that story, I, I mean it, it was at Berkeley County. In Berkeley County, like this is the way the the media manipulates people in Berkeley County. They the headline was uh, school district fires first black superintendent. And you know what happened in the same night? That they hired a black superintendent. They hired the second black superintendent. <laughs> but nobody wrote that part. Because that part's boring, Tiffany. I mean, you need to get into well, journalism and understand how this works. That's the why I'm, That's why I come on the podcast news. and fight with Will to get people excited about, about sure. diverse conversations. Yeah. <laughs> Vibrant conversations. Yeah, thanks a lot. She is Tiffany Justice, co-founder of Mom to Liberty. Thank you, Tiffany, for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Thank you. I got a country to say, God bless the USA. Land of the free and a home of the brave. God get all of the praise. I got a country to say, cause I'm Patriot J and I'm saving a day.